Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Moses writes in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, that the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And then, two chapters later, or rather the next chapter later, in chapter 3, when Adam sinned and God cursed him, he cursed him so that his end would reflect his beginning. He said, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. And it's not just Adam himself that's made of dust, but all of his progeny, all of his descendants. For Abraham confesses this to God in Genesis 18, 27. He says, I am but dust and ashes. And so all mankind, from Adam to all of us, are when it comes down to it simply dust, dirt, ground. Because of our, and because of our sin, both Adam's and our own, on the day that we die, we will then return to dust. And what do you do with dirt? What do you do with soil? What do you do with earth? Well, you plant seeds in it so that those seeds can grow up into plants and that those plants can produce vegetables and fruit for the sustaining of life. And so during this life of toil and labor, which he has given to us sinners, God has showed us that his will is that he would implant his seed in us, and that he would, through that seed, bear fruit to maturity in all who hear it. This is what Jesus speaks of in today's parable. A sower went out to sow his seed. And Jesus later explains the parable to the disciples and to us that the seed is the word of God. St. Peter reminds us of this in 1 Peter 1, 23. He says that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The first birth that we experience in the flesh is due to the corruptible, sinful seed of man, our fathers. But the second birth, our rebirth, our spiritual birth, occurs when God sows the incorruptible seed of his gospel into our hearts, and that takes root and bears fruit to maturity. James calls it in James 1.21, the implanted word which is able to save your souls. And so the word of God isn't sowed, though, like modern farmers sow, fields, that sow in their fields. Nowadays, at least as I remember growing up in the Midwest, farmers would plant their seeds in nice straight rows, or, well, in rows, and they would all be a standardized length apart from one another to maximize the growth, to allow room for growth. Farming is so scientific these days, but not so in the ancient Near East. In the ancient Near East, it reflects the picture that's on the front of the bulletin this morning. The sower simply has a satchel, reaches his hand down into it, grabs a handful of seed, and lets it go. And this particular sower, which Jesus tells about in the parable, well, he seems quite reckless with the whole ordeal. As he sowed, Jesus tells us, some fell by the wayside, and it is trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. Now, the parable obviously isn't about farming techniques, but about the preaching of the gospel, the preaching of the word, and then the four types of the human heart, the four states of the human heart, upon which the seed of the word of God falls. The sower sows his seed into the soil, into the dirt, into the dust of the ground from which you and I are taken. And there's no question at all that we are dust, that we are soil. The question is rather, what kind of dirt are you? And so Jesus tells us in this parable that there are four types. The first, he says, is the wayside. That's better translated the path. This is a path that many people have taken through a field so that this soil is compacted and hardened because of the continual footfalls upon it. As the seed lands upon this path, this wayside, the ground being hard and compacted, well, because of the hardness of the soil, the seed can't penetrate that soil. And so it simply bounces off the soil and comes to rest upon the surface of it. And there, the birds of the air, as if hovering around the sower, come immediately and snatch it up off the hard, compacted soil. 
Jesus says this is a picture of those who hear them. And then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. These are the hearts that are hardened by their sin. They're recalcitrant in their unbelief. They hear the word of God from time to time, perhaps, but they don't let it penetrate their hearts because they imagine that it's simply man's word. Perhaps ancient stories and fairy tales that really don't have anything to do with 21st century folk like ourselves. They may hear the word, and they may meditate upon it for just a moment, but they really don't want to have anything to do with it. They don't take it to heart. They don't ponder it. They feel as if they don't need the word. They don't care for the fruit that God wants to bear in them. And so, as they reject the word, as they give no place to it in their heart, as they don't mix it with faith, as the author of Hebrews says, the bird of prey, our old evil foe and adversary, the devil, swoops in, takes the word, lest they believe. This is the devil's foremost goal for all mankind, including you, his, God's Christians. Satan's goal is to take God's word out of your hearts, so that you don't meditate upon it, so that you don't ponder it, so that you don't, in faith, come to believe it more and more each day and be strengthened in that. For if you have been separated from the Word, then you will be like unto these folks with this type of soil, who would rather have the things of this life than the things of the life of the world to come. And the people that would rather remain in their sins than enjoy the benefits and sweetness of the forgiveness of all of their sins. For such is the heart of the unbeliever, hardened, compacted, obdurate, allowing the word no room whatsoever. The second kind of soil, then, is the heart of man that is rocky and can, can, or can uh, withhold or retain no moisture. So Jesus explains the ones who on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root, who believe for a while and in time of temptation fall away. These hearts hear the word. They accept it immediately. They're joyful over the things that it offers them. They rejoice in the word that is implanted in their hearts, but their hearts are stony and rocky so that that word can't take root and develop. And since the word can't take root and develop within, it, within their heart through continued teaching and faith, whenever the time of trial and temptation comes, and it will come, they abandon the word. <laughs> They imagine that the word of God was to make their lives easier or happier. They imagine this was to give them a better life. And so then when they hear that God allows Satan, the world, and our own sinful flesh to tempt us, not to lead us away from the faith, but to test our faith and to exercise our faith, they want no part of it. Because they expected God to graciously remove all of their temptations so that they have no struggles whatsoever. They hear Jesus' words, take up your cross and follow me. They hear St. Paul's words, that we must suffer much to enter the kingdom of God, and they abandon the word. For they don't want to suffer anything for the sake of the word. They don't want to make any sacrifice in order to hear it and confess it purely. They don't want to suffer anything for the sake of confessing the true doctrine. They want, or they don't want, the hearing of the word to interfere with their lives, with their Sunday schedules, or with anything else. And being tempted to value other things, overhearing God's word, they fall away from the faith because that word which was implanted in them simply can't take root. The third kind of soil, Jesus says, the third kind of heart of man, is a thorny soil. This soil, as the seed lands upon it, is already home to an invasive species that refuses to yield its space with any other plant. Jesus says, now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. These are hearts that are focused solely and intently upon earthly matters and can hardly give any thought to spiritual matters. These are hearts infested with the thorns of cares, riches, and the pleasures of life. We all have cares. In fact, I have yet to meet a single person in this world that doesn't have cares and problems and challenges of life. And they need attention. That's part of the reason that God gives us his strength each day, so that we may attend to the cares of this life. But rather, people, so many people give their entire lives and thoughts of the heart to the cares of this life. So that they are weighed down with worry to imagine that this life is the only life. 
Riches we are aware of easily ensnare the heart with worry. Riches ensnare the heart and lead us away from faith. Because so many people are intent on protecting the riches that God has already given them, or complaining and grousing about all of the riches that God hasn't yet given them. And then there are the pleasures of this life, which far too many value. Carnal, fleshly pleasures, not just the simple and moderate, temperate enjoyment of your labor, of your spouse, of your family, and all the blessings that God gives you, but rather the pleasures of life which are inordinate and overindulgence and sensuality, food and drink. The word cannot bear fruit in this heart, in this soil, because those thorns are already there. And those thorns grow up, they are not cut down through repentance. But the love of all of these worldly things rise up with the seed. They stifle it, and they eventually suffocate it. But the fourth kind of soil, the fourth kind of soil, the fourth kind of heart of man, is much different. The ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. These are those hearts where the seed finds a necessary home. For those hearts hear that seed, receive it for what it truly is, the very words of God himself. These hearts are a soft soil into which the seed implants itself, begins to take root and grow. Not only does it grow, but that seed cultivates that heart further and further each day. Because it's not simply enough just to hear the word and accept it superficially without pondering it. It isn't enough to hear the word and then let prickly thorns arise around it to suffocate it. Rather, the word has to be pondered, has to be meditated upon so that it can take root, so that it can grow, and at the appropriate time, it may bear fruit. The fruit that the sower wants to bear in the field and soil of your heart is repentance, sorrow over your sins. The fruit is faith in Christ's death and his merits, faith in Christ's perfect righteousness which he earns to us and promises to give to all who flee to him for mercy. The fruit then that he desires to bear in you is the fruit of repentance, that you would strive for sanctification, strive for holiness, good works towards your neighbor, chastity towards yourself, love towards those around you. These are the fruits that he wishes to bear in you. And he says, lest you become frustrated with the little fruits that you see from time to time, he also adds that the seed bears fruit with patience. For just as a physical seed needs time, an entire season, to take root, to grow, to produce, and to mature that fruit, so the seed of God's word is continually throughout our lives growing in our hearts, producing these fruits in their due season. God calls us and to grow. He, he grows our repentance daily through meditation upon his Ten Commandments. Not just that we outwardly do them, but do we inwardly do them from the heart. And of course, we see that we don't, which is why we've included the confessional mirror there in the bulletin during our pre-Lenten and Lenten season, so that we may daily look at that, and that we may daily see the depth of our sinfulness and grow in our repentance. He wants us to grow in our faith and through meditation upon the gospel as well. That we grow each day in looking at and contemplating just precisely what Christ has acquired and earned for us in his innocent life, in his bitter sufferings and death. That all of that he earns for us so that we poor sinners might have life and forgiveness and justification. He wants us then in that faith to grow in our good works to grow daily in our love for neighbor, to grow in all of the fruits which the Holy Spirit wants to bear in us, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control, and the like. And it's for this reason, dear saints, that Jesus gives us this parable again this year on this day. He gives this parable to us so that we might remember that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. But before we return to dust, he wants to daily implant his word in us. He wants us to daily look at what kind of soil we are so that we can make sure that we are always hearing the word of God appropriately and in a God-pleasing way so that it can daily take root in us, so that it may daily grow into a God-pleasing plant, so that it may then produce the fruits of repentance, of faith, and of good works, leading then, on the day in which we are turned back into dust, into the fruit of everlasting life.
Amen. And now may the peace of God, which far surpasses all human understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise. We continue by singing our offertory on page 22.